I'm Billy S, welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a trip to our Archstones so we can rank the Demon Souls PS3 areas from worst to best. If you missed my last Demon Souls ranking on the bosses, click the card in the top right corner or check it out after the video. The Archstones of Demon Souls are unique in that they lack any connection with each other. They are five standalone worlds from which you journey to from the Nexus, so your bearing in Boletaria has no effect on Stonefang Tunnel and vice versa. Each world is split into zones, and those are what we'll be ranking today. Please be aware though that I won't be ranking the four Archdemon zones on screen now, as they act primarily as boss arenas and not fully blown levels. But just for posterity's sake, my ranking would go 2-3, then 3-3, then 5-3, and my favourite is 4-3. So which of these areas stand the test of time, and which fell short of their maiden voyage? Let's rank all 15 Demon Souls areas, and remember to share your thoughts in the comments below. When I think about Demon Souls areas I dislike playing through, only one area comes to mind. 2-2 The Tunnel City is perhaps the most confusingly disconnected area of the entire game, and it's not even close. It feels like the developers had no idea what they wanted this level to be. From the outset you have two paths to take. The left leads to the main meat of the level, while the right leads to a platforming shaft that takes you, get this, directly to the boss. While that means we get a fairly simple boss run back once you figure out the route, it also begs the question, why bother going to the left? Because if you choose to explore the left side of the Tunnel City, you'll be dealing with exploding minecarts, exploding bear bugs, and rock worms with a weak hitbox that's incredibly hard to hit as a melee build. You can meet Patches and ruin his plan to trap you, resulting in a hilariously comical scene as you kill this massive bear bug while he's just gesturing at you to stop. And it ends in an explosion that, while it doesn't kill the man, certainly leaves him with his pride in shambles. There's a trader who sells great ore at a fairly affordable price. You just have to kill an entire horde of flying bear bugs to actually use his shop with any sense of privacy. And then you re-enter the tunnels and get lost in claustrophobic caverns with nary the space to move. Yes, the ore resources available in this level are fantastic, and there is a crystal lizard nest if you're into easy to obtain ores, but the level progression is a slog to play through and none of the enemies feel fun or intuitive to fight. In future playthroughs, I'll take my shortcut down to Flame Lurker and skip the hassle. Next up, we have the unanimously declared worst area in Demon Souls, 5-2 The Swamp of Sorrow. Only after my recent playthrough, I don't necessarily agree. I actually think the Valley of Defilement gets a lot of flack it doesn't deserve. This area's main flaws are the immense size of the swamp, making progression more of a chore, and the inability to roll within the swamp's murky depths. This naturally leads to a few tough enemy encounters, and players unprepared can find themselves at the mercy of the giant depraved ones or the poison jelly swarms. But I really enjoy the ambiance of this place. The way you can see the settlement across the water through the dimly lit lanterns as you enter is a really striking visual. And the main path through the swamp is pretty clear cut if you follow the flames. The poison is also actually pretty bearable, though I totally understand the disdain for this type of level design. But I say we might as well get with it. Miyazaki loves his swamps, they're here to stay forever whether we want them or not. The village settlement is a fun little slice of normal level design to bring you back after your swamp trek, complete with poison depraved ones that use the same sound effects for the poison as the poison corvians in Dark Souls 3. Crafty Queen's over at FromSoft, I see you. The effect of the flies on screen as you get closer to the source of the plague was also a nice touch, if a bit low budget. You can also find the Moonlight Greatsword in this level, which in my opinion is a massive positive. I do wish we had more than a single shortcut though, linking the village to the Archstone, perhaps one that lets us avoid half of the swamp given its immense size and lack of content. 
but even if I didn't enjoy the journey through these fetid waters, this area is raised a level by the inclusion of the legendary Cat Ring. PS3 Demon Souls at its finest. I will not forgive the remake for removing this icon. Uh, fun fact, I almost forgot to include the tutorial on my list when putting together this script, so that tells you kind of what I think about it. But what I didn't forget to mention was that over 90% of my viewers aren't subscribed to my YouTube channel. Let's rectify that, guys. I don't think FromSoft have made a bad tutorial level, and the way the player is eased into the game with simple soldiers and an easily parryable pair of blue-eyed knights is more than enough experience for what comes next. This level is more disjointed, using arch stones as warping points to other portions of the map, which is an interesting mechanic that never gets used again? What a shame. I like that prior to the boss fights here, you're only fighting normal enemies, so it really emphasizes the severity of your decision to enter the colorless fog and pursue the demons of Boletaria, when you step into Vanguard's chamber and are met with this colossal chonky man. Of course, if you beat the boss, you get a brief look at a dragon god in a volcanic temple, and if that doesn't set the stage for the journey to come, I don't know what will. A short entry here, I debated on whether to include Below the Nexus in my area rankings, as it's a fairly brief location with nary a hint of level layout to begin with. But then I realized it's my list, and I love the design of the old one, and the sweeping ruins, and the sand-swept beaches. This is the final frontier, as you enter the Old Ones more and descend to fight the Vor fetishist of Boletaria himself, True King Alant. I enjoy the fact that while the Old One is a creature of eldritch proportions, its design is less alien and more natural in its construction. Withered branches, foliage, trees, it's the source of all evil in Boletaria and the wider world, and yet it looks so beautiful. You can see why it was able to enrapture so many in its beauty. That shot of the maiden in black calming it so we may enter is one of my favorite cinematics in the game, and pretty much ensured I'd be including it on my list. If there's one thing Demon Souls fans can agree on, it's that the boss run back for 4-2 The Ritual Path is the most unforgiving in the game. The downward descent through the Shrine of Storms forces the player to deal with a whole host of different enemy types, looking to make progress a living nightmare. The Reaper in the first room is fine, providing an excellent soul farm, especially combined with the infamous pure bladestone black skeleton behind the illusory wall that you'll be killing for 100% completion anyway, gives a great surplus of souls too. It's everything else in this level that's the problem. The moment you kill your first Reaper and step out into the fresh air, you're greeted by the worst stretch of level I have played in a long time. Three blue-eyed skeletons, we all know how irritating they can be in this game, and then further down the path you have two extra hard golden skeletons. These two are my kryptonite, absolutely tough as nails and able to kill you in a hit or two. I am aware that they are weak to magic, but I was not running a magic build. That's not even mentioning the storm beasts sniping you from afar every time you come out. And if you come to this area in Black World Tendency, like I accidentally did in my original playthrough because I didn't know about the World Tendency mechanic, <sighs> this entire level suffers from being painfully linear with no chance for shortcuts, and filled to the brim with devastating enemies that can take you out in a few hits, even in late game. The Slug Cave is pretty neat though, love getting that sticky white stuff, and I think the overall area has one of my favorite aesthetics with the ancient burial ground temple vibe, but this is the only Demon Souls level to straight up make me rage, and for that, it lands outside my top 10. And cracking in my top 10, we have 1-4, The King's Tower. Keep in mind these area rankings don't take the area bosses into consideration, so with that in mind, I think King's Tower is a fairly simple level that provides a few fighting challenges and then a rather annoying dragon encounter. Yes, you can get the Mausoleum Key from Astrava and fight his Red Phantom form. Yes, you can fight the Red Phantom gank squad of warriors based on the past Boletarian demons you fought. 
And yes, you can watch two fat officials get roasted by a dragon. Pero para mí, the dragon really lowers the stock of 1-4. On my first playthrough, I struggled to find the right timing to get past its fire breath, resulting in many repeat runs across those battlements. Yet somehow in this playthrough, I managed it first try? I find Demon Souls level design really excels on repeat playthroughs, and I'll be using that to justify a hot take later in the list, but I can't really place the King's Tower any higher when the level itself doesn't feel that exciting to play. It just feels like a follow-on from 1-3 as opposed to its own unique experience, and killing the Blue Dragon just isn't worth the time it'll take, so Beor really just gets sent to die every time. For some reason though, the Blue Dragon blasting Bjor audio kept playing for me on the elevator up to Old King Alant, and through the boss fight. I can still hear it to this day. It's rare to see a level revolve around such a singular gimmick, but 1-2 The Lord's Passage takes the dragon roasting bridge trope we've all come to expect in our Souls games, but makes a full level out of it. Instead of the flames roasting every inch of the stone, the red dragon has a set series of areas it can toast, meaning you can either make the sprint to the next watchtower while risking the fiery wrath of the wyvern, or you can head beneath the cobbles into the dark underpassage of the bridge. Here you can save Ostrava from being hounded by soldiers to progress his questline, and you get your first experience with Soul Series Doggos. This is a fairly uneventful level that goes in so hard on its gimmick that it hits a middle point in my rankings where I respect it enough and enjoy the journey to keep it out of my bottom tier, but I think it's held back by extremely linear level design and a tedious boss run back that forces you to brave the dragon's flames or the tunnels filled with enemies. And that's not even counting the two blue knights awaiting you at the very end. Good thing they're a good farming spot for early game grasses, or I might have to bump this area down a spot. You can kill the red dragon to make progression easier on yourself, but you'll either have to do arrow cheese, or this method, using one of the game's longsword weapons to chink away at its health. Not worth it when you can just leave the items, beat the tower knight, and assuming you're now in pure white world tendency, explore at your leisure as the dragons will despawn. After unlocking 1-3, you can also return to this level to free Bior in the dungeon, and you claim nope. the tower shield as a prize as well. And also, most importantly, the merchant sells my baby. My hot take of this video that nobody will agree with, and that's totally okay. On my first playthrough, 5-1 Depraved Chasm was a confusing, claustrophobic cacophony of cursed content. But on more recent playthroughs, I really enjoyed this area and its level layout. It's far more straightforward than people made it out to be in other area rankings I've watched. The paths forward to me are clear, you have to handle some typical Souls platforming, but I think it's the good kind. I never found myself slipping off of a platform or dropping to my death like I did in Blight Town. I imagine coming to 5-1 in the early game may reveal a different story, and I do respect that if you're coming here with early game stats, I'll have to give it a try one day myself. But making my way downwards, passing through the wrecked underbelly of this seedy chasm, feels like delving into the depths of despair in the best way possible. Ramshackled and ruined, but traversable. On White World Tendency, there's even an extra area you can climb up to for a legendary spear. My only complaints come from a few enemies, firstly the Fire Spear Depraved Ones, their attacks come out so fast I always got clipped by them. And then the rats that give you the plague, they're so small and hard to hit that they can be frustrating if they get ya. But if you take the time to look around, assess the scenery, and not just run headfirst into danger, this area is extremely manageable. And in my humble opinion, maybe this is a hot take? Superior to Blight Town and the gutter in every way. I especially love the way the area begins to change as you get closer to the boss, with leeches coating the walls and the floor to signify you may be dealing with something a little more disgusting than previously anticipated. But guys, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, or you'll have to make your way to the Valley of Defilement, and I know you guys watching at home don't want that. <laughs>
We're reaching the best of the best levels already as we're lifted up into 3-2 Upper Latria. I think the Tower of Latria Archstone has such a unique and haunting vibe that I can't wait to gush about. We'll get to 3-1 later, but for 3-2, there's this eldritch, unnatural vibe to the surroundings that reminds me of traversing the nightmare levels of Bloodborne. I wonder if that has to do with the chained up giant beating heart that reverberates throughout the level? You can hear it thrumming in the background as you traverse the walkways and towers surrounding it, with the goal of dropping it down so you can progress up. What elevates Latria is the addition of the swamp below, an entire second portion of the level that you couldn't have seen coming. And the best part, it's not poisonous! And it doesn't inhibit movement! meaning you're free to fight and loot everything without a care in the world. There are giant man centipedes throughout looking to get a quick bite, and they're extremely creepy with their death animations, but manageable with the right build. I especially love the way they populate the level further after the beating heart is dropped. That scene of them emerging from the viscera was not something I needed to see. The other main enemy type here are Hello. the gargoyles who, they're trying their best. <laughs> It's clear that AI was not very developed when it came to these winged beasts, and they end up coming across as extremely goofy instead of intimidating, which is a shame because I really Hi. like their overall design with the glowing red eyes. A surprisingly linear overall level that manages to feel non-linear with how you move across the whole map, and an almost perfect experience. Almost. <laughs> Coming in at number 6, we have the hub of Demon Souls, the Nexus. Anybody who watched my Dark Souls area ranking video knows that I like to keep my hubs out of the top 5, so as to let the actual levels of the game shine at the top of the list. But in this case, I may upset some viewers, I don't feel like I have much connection to the Nexus. The Maiden in Black's theme is welcoming and soft, with enough silences to allow you a chance to reflect on your journey, while the shift to the organ music after your third Archdemon is a nice change of pace that makes the safe space of this nexus feel a little bit more ominous. My issue is just that there's so much empty space and not a lot to do here. The closest hub in comparison to this would be Firelink Shrine from Dark Souls 3, but that hub had an explorable outside level and various hidden items to find throughout. The Nexus is just bare bones, containing NPCs, the Archstones, and a child that nobody can find on their first playthrough. <laughs> the atmosphere sells everything, and I get a little small kick out of walking on the floor seal of the old one, but I just prefer the more interconnected, homely, condensed vibes of the other hubs in the series. Still, it is a grandiose area with a gorgeous aesthetic, and comfortably lands at number 6. Starting out my top 5, we have 2-1, The Smithing Grounds. Most likely the first world you visit once you unlock all the archstones, The Smithing Grounds is a valuable location due to the sheer amount of upgrade ore you can find, as well as access to Blacksmith Ed who handles this game's boss soul upgrades. You start off next to a merchant who sells basic ores, and then you have to explore the cavern to unlock the elevator to the main blacksmith. This level can go one or two ways depending on the weapon you have equipped. If you have a pierce weapon, like I did in my recent playthrough, you're gonna have a fantastic time here. Otherwise, you're gonna be doing barely any damage to the main enemies, the scale miners, like I did in my first playthrough. What I like about the smithing ground specifically is that it feels like you're exploring an active mine with machinery strewn about the place, furnaces lit by fire lizards, and fat officials overlooking the work. There are a few good gotcha moments with various collapsing bridges, a few tight corridor ambushes, and ways to approach enemies in different manners. I love that the path to progression involves using the machinery to cool the lava leading towards the end of the area. But perhaps my favourite aspect of the Smithing Grounds is actually an incredibly subtle moment. I'd like you to listen to this clip for a second. Do you hear that ominous sound? It plays the moment you first see the spiderwebs, 
and sets the tone for the upcoming boss. It was genuinely uncomfortable in a really good way. The PS5 remake, on the other hand, omits the sound entirely, at least from what I could tell from YouTube clips. A fantastic piece of atmosphere you'll only experience in the PS3 game. Once you slay your first Archdemon, you gain access to 1-3, The Inner Ward. The level layout is heavily reminiscent of Hemwick Charnel Lane in Bloodborne and the Undead Parish in Dark Souls, where you'll find yourself unable to progress due to a gate and are forced to find a way around by going up and over the entire area. Here the enemies are tougher than before, take more hits to kill, and are placed in more devious locations. Fat officials, Imperial spies, even a trio of red-eye knights before the boss door, you'll be dealing with all of that and more. Carefully placed archers, fireball traps, you have to be on your toes to handle the challenge. It's an enemy gauntlet where you go into the alleys, up to the rooftops, and then down to the main gate, and shows just how far you've come when you walk back through the streets having slain all your foes. There's also a running storyline between you and the fat officials constantly trying to slay you with traps, ending with a satisfying penetrative climax. You can rescue Ostrava when unlocking the shortcut gate linking the upper and lower ward, giving you an extra bit of challenge before making your way to the boss, and you can take a detour to go rescue Yuria if you've already received the key from the dungeon in 1-2. And in the remake, of course, you can collect the ceramic coins that ultimately gives you access to the Penetrator's armor set. The only reason Inner Ward doesn't crack my top three is because it's such a linear level, and I personally prefer the slightly non-linear progression of the three areas above. So let's get to them, shall we? If there's a level that people think of when they hear Demon Souls, I think my top three levels are those, and 4-1 Island's Edge would be up there on the forefront of their minds. Who hasn't heard of the Demon Souls skeletons no, and their no, roly-poly no, no. antics? But of course, this level is more than just those opening skeletons that kill every newcomer who comes a knockin'. The Shrine of Storms is one of my favorite archstones aesthetically. I love storms and rain and clouds, so seeing this windswept island ruin in the ocean, I felt right at home. You have a few directions you can take, heading into the battlements, battling a red-eyed skeleton, going underground to free Grave Robber Blige. You get a rematch with the Vanguard Demon, so if you didn't kill him in the tutorial, Now's your chance! So just casually getting my revenge on the tutorial boss because they have... What? <gasps> oh. I just got instant karma so hard. <laughs> All the while, Stormways... <laughs> Stormways! All the while, Storm Rays fire down upon you with intent to kill. They can be a little irritating to an extent, especially when you're in the final stretch of the level trying to defeat that gold skeleton. We also get the first incarnation of the Crow Traders with Sparkly the Crow, Icon Legend we stan, but my favourite aspect of this level is how brutal it is. You have no choice but to go through everything if you die. No shortcuts, get through it but the level is non-linear enough at the start that you have to actually figure out where you're supposed to go, so each death feels more like a learning experience. Luckily, this level ends with the easiest and worst boss in the game, in my opinion, so if you make it to that fog gate, you shouldn't die. And if you did die, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Our silver medalist today is 1-1, The Gates of Boletaria. The true opening level of the game, I don't know if this is controversial to say, but I think it is honestly one of the best opening levels in any Souls game. The fact that Elden Ring's Stormvale Castle practically ripped an area idea from 1-1 when you're climbing up the wall through those rickety staircases says a lot. This is one of the most expansive opening levels in the series only truly rivaled by the Great Wall of Lothric, with so many branching paths and locations to visit, two shortcuts to unlock, and even an endgame extra location you can't access right away. From the moment you ascend the walls and enter the inner barracks, you can choose to cross the battlements and meet the merchant, or drop down to Ostrava and help him wipe out the dreglings below. Saving him is very important for progressing his storyline, and he can help you clear out the lower courtyards on his patrol route. 
I really love this little metal ball trap midway through the level too, where you can break the wood and send these orbs rolling down to crush the enemies ahead. We also get a classic dragon bridge filled to the brim with enemies that you'll have to run through quick enough to avoid being roasty toasty roasted. Or you can head to the left and actually find the dragons who'll be harassing you in future levels, chilling on that lovely little cliffside. That is, unless you're in pure white tendency, in which case they will vanish and you can collect their loot no problem, including this game's equivalent of the Havel's Ring. There's also an extra Executioner's Courtyard to check out in either Pure White or Pure Black Tendency, ending with a battle against Executioner Meralda, and obtaining a colorless soul. There's just so much going on in this level, and I've only scratched the surface. A brilliant introduction to Demon Souls and the Souls universe. Yet my favorite area of Demon Souls is 3-1 Prison of Hope in the Tower of Latria Archstone. Never before have I played a Souls game that has given me quite a sense of discomfort being in an area. The atmospheric design of the PS3 version of Latria is, in my opinion, completely unmatched in the series, aside from maybe Yahagul in Bloodborne. From the way you can hear the rattling of doors, the screams of prisoners above, the chiming of the bells from the wardens, the desperate cries of the hollows locked away, blood splattering the floors, the hallways, the walls. This is a place of death and torture. The sound cue when you open the Iron Maiden traps is jump scare inducing. And yet the beautiful singing of a royal merchant pierces through the gloom when you're nearby her cell on floor four. The remake included the singing as ambiance throughout the entire prison, which really takes away from the feeling the original Latria gave, which is why I'm focusing on the PS3 edition. Of course, the non-linear exploration and the challenge to collect all the keys needed to progress feels almost Resident Evil-like in its execution. There are monsters on the lowest floors beyond your comprehension, a sage to free in his cell above, an ancient device used to stop any from approaching the church beyond. The Mind Flayers are terrifying guards who will run towards you at the speed of a predator about to catch its prey. They grab, freezing you in place so they can spear your mind and send you back to your resting place. And then, if you break free of the prison itself, you have to make the journey to the church, killing a suspicious servant along the way, before defeating the fool's idol and dispelling the Queen of Latria's image from the hearts of those tortured souls. 3-1 feels like it could only exist in Demon Souls. They tried to recreate it with Irithyll Dungeon in Dark Souls 3, and it just didn't feel the same, also partly because the jailers in Dark Souls 3 have bullshit mechanics, but oh well. The Prison of Hope is the best area in Demon Souls, and one of the best atmospheric areas in the entire franchise. And that's my final thought on this matter. What about you guys? Which levels do you enjoy, and which do you think belong in the trash? Try and find a compliment for your least favorite level and leave it in the comments below, I'd love to see some positivity up in here. Thank you for watching, my socials are on screen now, feel free to follow where you feel comfortable. Next week, I'll be discussing mechanics in Demon's Souls that we see referenced or used throughout the Soulsborne series. Have a good one guys, adios.